Precious. Amen. Precious. I want to share with you this morning out of the gospel. You'll turn with me in your scriptures to the sixth chapter. We're going to begin reading at the 17th verse. And soon when you get there, you're going to recognize that this is a documentation of a special sermon that Jesus gave. And it's often been titled the Beatitudes. Okay? Luke tells it a little differently than Matthew. If you go back into Matthew's gospel, Matthew says that as the crowd started to gather, Jesus took his disciples up on a hill above the Sea of Galilee uh, so that he could speak to them directly because even Luke says that these words are shared for the disciples. If you go to Israel today, if you go to the Sea of Galilee, and you go to that place that historically they've commemorated that Sermon on the Mount, there's a church, which they often do. To preserve those sites, they, they build a church. And there's a church there called the Church of the Beatitudes. And it overlooks the Sea of Galilee. But Luke says they were down on a flat place in the plain uh, when Jesus gave the disciples these words. Let's read, beginning with verse 17. <laughs> he came down with them and stood on a level place. And a great crowd of his disciples <laughs> and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. <coughs> and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him. For power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For surely the reward is great in that. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you who when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestor did to the false prophets. This is the word of God, written for the people of God. Thank you, God. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. See, I hear women's voices, I don't hear men. <laughs> Just in case you guys needed something else to panic about. It's just a friendly reminder for any of us who might be procrastinators. A fair warning. You know, I believe most people fall into three camps when it comes to Valentine's Day. There are folks who love it and plan for it and spend lots of money for it. Does that describe anybody in here? There are folks who shrug it off just another day of the year. And finally, there are those who roll their eyes at it and they, they hate the idea of a made up holiday and they, that promotes romance and chocolate. 
However, it's a shame that we don't celebrate love every day of the year. It's too easy to take our loved ones for granted. No matter which of the, of the three camps you fall into, I hope that you take some time every day to notice and appreciate the people who love you. Don't let a day go by without letting someone know that you love and appreciate. One of the most, most famous landmarks in the world is the statue of Jesus with outstretched arms. I mean, I, I imagine everyone in here has seen the picture of that, if not seen it for their own, in, in their own eyes. You know where that's at? Brazil? Rio de Janeiro? Where they held one of the recent Olympics? Jesus got Worldwide building. It's called Jesus the Redeemer. And Jesus stands atop of a, a high point above the Rio de Janeiro, which is the capital of Brazil. And the statue stands at 125 foot tall. It has inspired many visitors to that city. But right now, if you didn't know, there's an organization that is gathering funds to build another Jesus statue in a neighboring city called Rio Grande do Sol. And they plan for their statue to be 145 feet tall. And there's going to be a special uh, feature in this statue that an elevator is going to be able to take you up to an observation place where these big plate glass windows are. And they place those plate glass windows just about where Jesus' heart would be located. He's going to be called Jesus the Protector. 16 feet. Well, I'm sorry, 141 feet for the statue will be, which makes it a 16 feet taller than the original windows located right where Jesus art would be you'll be able to view the surrounding city literally from the heart can you imagine what that view would be like from Jesus. Because that is the goal, brothers and sisters, of the Christian life. When we view the world through the lens of Jesus, we realize the purpose of our life is not in our own fulfillment and happiness. The purpose of our life is to live as Jesus lived. That means sharing God's love with others. The purpose of our life is to do the good works God created us to do. The purpose of our life is to re represent Jesus' character, his mission, and his message to the world. Pretty tall task, might you say. And you thought buying a the right Valentine's Day gift was going to difficult. That's why today's scripture is appropriate for Valentine's Day. Because Jesus' teachings come from a place of grace, pure, unmerited, unearned love. We often call it a God. Even his toughest teachings, the ones that make us squirm, the ones that offend us, the ones that challenge our worldview, come from a place of love. Even his words, as they challenge us, 
even though they might be harsh in places in this passage. We are to view these words through Jesus' heart. And if we did, how would that change our response? Before we understand this passage, it's neat. we need to look at who Jesus was speaking to. Jesus had been teaching out in the countryside and healing people. A great crowd had gathered, like the scripture tells us, from all Judea, Jerusalem, and even Gentile towns, Tyre and Sidon, that were Gentiles coming. Jesus was popular. His ministry would be envy, the envy of any pastor in today's setting. In the midst of all this excitement, Jesus directs the words quite surprisingly to his disciples. So think about that now as we speak these words, as Jesus speaks these words, he's talking, the scripture tells us, directly to them. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. What's Jesus telling his disciples? You've given up all that you had. You gave up your families. You gave up your businesses. You walked away from comfort. You've made yourselves poor. But the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry now. The disciples went for days on end without a lot to eat. Jesus tells them, you will be satisfied. <clears throat> Blessed are you who weep now, who mourn after their loved ones, who might have passed, ones that said, why are you leaving the family and why are you leaving the business? And don't you know what a problem that's going to cause us? That's bound to cause them pain. To left the ones they love. He said, one day you will celebrate, you will laugh. You will be happy. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leave the joy. Because greater, the great is your reward. Where? In heaven. Woe to the rich, you who are rich, for you have already received your reward. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for this is how their ancestors treated the false prophet. Here's my question. Here's something that seemed just a little out of place. Jesus has all these people around him. The scripture tells us that. But he's speaking directly to his disciples. Both gospels tell us that. Why is he addressing the disciples in this message? And I believe one of the first things he's trying to tell them, and one of the first things he's trying to tell us, don't judge your life by the current circumstances. Think about that now just for a minute. Don't Judge your life by the current circumstances. Don't set your heart on the things of this world. That's not what you were made for. You're, you're healthy, wealthy, popular, and powerful now, possibly. Good for you. 
but don't base your happiness, self-worth, or security on these things. Or perhaps you're poor. Maybe you're greedy, unpopular, or persecuted right now. God be with you. But don't base your attitude or your self-worth on these things. Your circumstances don't define you. Whether your circumstances drive you closer to God or further from God is what's important. Remember, this is a moment when Jesus starts rising. Crowds of people follow him everywhere he goes. They hang on his every word. They want to reach out and touch him. But Jesus never lets his popularity affect his mission. He didn't want his disciples to think that following him was the way to reach earthly rewards. In fact, it was just the opposite, wasn't it? If you read comprehensively the Gospels in the, in the, in the life of Jesus, it blows the prosperity gospel out of the water. He never talked about being rich here. He never talked about being rewarded here. He always addressed our eternal situation, our eternal life with him in heaven. He always emphasized for us to concentrate on what would last for ever. It's easy to let the good things in life, good health or close relationships or social acceptance or status symbol to become the foundation of our attitude or our worldview or our identity. But these pleasures, rather than drawing us closer to God, often drive us further away. The second thing Jesus tell, is telling them, I believe, is God is working even in your most painful circumstances. That's the perspective we gain when we view our painful circumstances through Jesus' heart. If we search for God's presence, rely on God's power, and if we open ourselves up to God's mercy in our most painful times, then we will eventually catch glimpses of God working in our most painful circumstances. Jesus already knew the end of the story. He already knew that he would die and reconcile us to God and give us eternal life. He already knew that God was a, had a kingdom prepared for those who love him. And he already knows that every painful circumstance we face in our life can be used to draw us closer to God and to God's heart and to God's purpose if we're willing. And finally, Jesus was telling them to find their fulfillment in living for him. There are many places in the world that you can seek fulfillment. But there's only one place that you can truly find. As the old gospel hymn says, this world is not mine. You were made for eternal life with God. But what happens when the worlds collide? What happens when the worlds begin to compete? What happens when you live the values and priorities of God's world in this world? You won't fit. You won't fit in. Your habits and your lifestyle will look different to your family and to your colleagues and to your neighbors. People will question you. People will talk about you. They might even reject you. The disciples hadn't comprehended it yet, but Jesus was calling them to make the ultimate sacrifice. To eventually die for the sake of following him. 
And he's calling us to do the same. Even if he, even if we're never asked to lay down our lives for Jesus, we're called to sacrifice our own priority and our own values and our own will, replacing them with the priorities and values and will of God. That last night with the disciples, the last time he was with them, the last prayer that he said in their presence ended with not my will, but yours be done. We can find temporal satisfaction in chasing success and wealth and comfort and security, but we will never find fulfillment or our God-given purpose in those things. God designed us to find our fulfillment and our purpose and our life in living for him. It's not going to be easy, and Jesus never Inferred that it were. So don't set your heart on the things of this world. Set your heart on knowing God and living in God's will. And then you will discover the life that God created. A life that is both abundant and a life that is eternal. In its blessings. I pray blessings upon all of you. But with that, I want you to understand that with those blessings come obligations. That those blessed are blessed to be a blessing. The only person in history. The only person in the confines of the gospel text that ever received that title, blessed among women, was Mary. Stop and think about Mary's life. Blessed among women who was asked to face all kinds of calamities, who suffered, who sacrificed, who held her innocent son in her lap as they took him down from the cross. She was blessed. But she wasn't blessed to receive creature comforts. She was blessed because she was serving God. Do you want to be blessed today? Then you better be willing to walk in his footsteps. For you'll never receive the fullness of that blessing until it passes away. In Jesus' name, God's people say, <clears throat> Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate through this sacrament that the Lord has left us called baptism. I have printed out a guide for this baptism to help us along the way. If someone, Tom, would you come and share these with us, please? Another Tom. Pass those out, please. All right. Now, while they're doing that, I want you to understand that the reason that I that I go through the reason I go through this is uh, it, it, because I want you to understand and know how important I believe this is that we all participate. That we understand that this baptism is a communal thing, and that it's important that you understand what your part is in this. 
that you're making promises to God and to one another for Aubrey faith. So I've tried to make that as convenient as possible and placing the right words in the right places because these, these sacraments are written for multiple people or both genders and uh, plurals and singulars mixed in. So I'd like for you to follow that. I'm going to help you do that because I want you to claim this child's life as a part of the community of faith. And those promises are in what you've received. So if I could ask for Joe and Lindsay to come to bring Aubrey Faith, and I'd like for all those who've come to sponsor them uh, to either come up front or to, or to uh, stand where you are, if you're able. I went to uh, the Holy Land. In November of 1995, and I brought back with me a gallon of water out of the gold roof. I've used that sparingly. The Duval family has sorely taxed my supply. <laughs> Aubrey Faith, you made it in under the wire because I don't even think they're done. <laughs> Amen. So I want you to know, believe this now. I've had this water since November 1995. That was Gold River. It looks like pawpaw creek, if I can help you understand. They don't know river. See that water? 1995. It's clear as the water comes out of the tap in your at your at your home. That's going to be added to this water that we're going to baptize Aubrey Faith with this morning. In so many ways, is though we know water moves and travels, it's the same place where Jesus was baptized by God. This is a memento for you, for her, to keep and to remember her baptism. Someday she's going to grow up and see that. And it'll help her remember the day on the bottom was on the bottom. And so that's for you to keep. So let's begin. If, Joan, Lindsay, would you just come over here, kind of turn and face each other like I was marrying her? <laughs> there you go. Come on over. Gather around. We want to get you all in the picture. Some of you come over here on this side too. There you go. There you go. There, there. Let's uh, let's go through this. These words, as they're important, right, for all of us to share as a community of faith. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's might, mighty acts of salvation and given a new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without cross. I'm going to have uh, Sandra, if you would be our representative for the church, and read. That first line, please. I present Aubrey Faith Wagerman for baptism. Thank you. This is I'm going to address to Joe Lindsay. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. If you do, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom of power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, 
in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Question to the sponsors. Will you nurture Aubrey Faith in Christ's holy church? That by teaching her, teaching an example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself and to profess her faith openly and to lead a Christian life. Continue. Will you sponsor, will you who sponsor Aubrey Faith support and encourage her in her Christian life? This is to the congregation. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Amen. Will you nurture this and this one, another in the Christian faith and life, and include this child now before you in your care? Okay, this is to everyone in a responsive movement. Let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the arms of God, and was crucified for God, who descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? The Lord be with you. When nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them from, to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Thanks to the Lord, all the earth, the God's mercy be shared. In the fullness of time, you said Jesus nurtured in the water of the womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make the disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it to wash away their sin and clothing and righteousness throughout their lives that dying and being raised with Christ they may share in his final decree. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you in the Holy Spirit, who lives and reigns forever. Amen. Amen. I baptize you, Aubrey Faith, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Brother and sister.
Holy Spirit work within you. That being born through water and the Spirit, you may be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Of your faith, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ. Brothers and sisters, let's stand and this is a new <laughs> member of your family. This is one of yours. Keep her in your prayers. Keep her in your examples. Keep her for the name of God has been faithful. <laughs> Joe Lindsay, you don't know. We can't even begin to conceive the life that that brings to our church. The promise of God and the hope for tomorrow. I love, I have a God that loves me more than life itself. And I do not believe that that kind of a God would send an offered faith into the world if there wasn't hope for tomorrow, brothers and sisters. She's evidence that God has a plan for you on your life and my life past this day. Joe Lindsay, you're welcome in this place. And we will hold you and love you and care for you. Of your faith, we love you. Your joy, your presence, of God Almighty. I remember when we brought John and Marie to her grandmother after getting her ears pierced. And she looked at us and said, What have you done to my baby? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, give God a hand. And I also, oh, I also have two, nine, two witnesses to sign this, whatever you choose for that to be. Here is her certificate, which documents this day. And a lady from Kingmont. Said, I want you to give this to Lindsay Joe as a gift for the bank. So that's yours. And I'll have someone sign this too, please. Right there on the bottom. You can return to your seat. Thank you so much. This baptismal font was made by George Swearingen. Once you know that, a brother who's, who passed away here just a few years ago. I guess it's been longer than a few, has it not thought? Uh, but George made this, crafted this himself for the church. God continues to raise up a remnant. Amen. He promises us that even in our loss, I will raise up a remnant. What a wonderful day. What a glorious day. What a beautiful day to celebrate life. Would you like to play one last song? Please, as we exit this place, we're a singing church, by the way. If anybody here that doesn't know that, uh, and, we, and part of the reason that we are is because we have a gifted person who loves music all the time. Six seventy-seven. Let's turn our hands.
the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, pour his countenance over you, and give you a peace that passes your understanding. In Jesus' name, God's people said, Amen. Amen.